Hello everyone, my name is John Sierra and I am a Tolkien scholar and I am here to answer your questions about the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, whether it be The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, The Silmarillion, The Children of Hurin, Fall of Numen, or whatever you can think of, or even questions about Tolkien himself. I'm the guy that you come to. So, uh, if you want to ask a question that's going to be featured in a video, you can, of course, ask questions in a comment. But if you want it to be featured in a video, the best way to do it is through Quora. Just look in the description, and you will see a link to my Quora account. You can write any question you want on there. It's very easy to make an account on there. You can use your Facebook account. You could use your Google account. And then just tag me, and I will get to it. And if I like the question a lot, every week, every Wednesday night, I will feature... The 15 or so, at this time it's 17, I seem to be uh, picking a lot more. My very favorite questions from the past week, and I got a lot of good questions, 17 of them. And of course, if you like the content, definitely hit the thumbs up, subscribe, make sure the bell notifications are on, because subscriptions really don't work the way that they're supposed to on YouTube. You really have to hit the bell, and, and you really have to leave comments too, because unless you engage with the videos, they even with the bell, they stop showing you them. I really don't know the purpose behind that, but that's just the way it is. Anyway, let's get to your questions. We have a lot of great questions this time. Okay, so first up, uh, here's a very simple one. Did Why did the elves make such a small sword as Sting? Was it really meant to be a letter opener? Okay, so that, that was a joke from the Hobbit movies. Uh, it wasn't a letter opener. It, it's a dagger. It's a small dagger that that's what it would be to an elf. To a hobbit, considering that they're much, much shorter, a dagger might as well be a sword, right? So Sting was, you know, Bilbo, Bilbo got this after the trolls were destroyed by the sunlight. And uh, it's a sword forged in Gondolin. He named it Sting. It didn't already have a name like the other two swords, the, the larger swords that uh, Thorin took and that Gandalf took that became... Thorin's sword was called Orchrist, which means Goblin Cleaver, and um, uh, Gandalf's sword was called Glamdring, which means Foe Hammer. Uh, the, the dagger that Bilbo took didn't have a name. He named it Sting later on in the story after he killed some spiders in Mirkwood. He named it Sting. It was a dagger. It wasn't a tiny sword. And daggers have a use in battle. There is a very good reason to have a dagger... Uh, not necessarily instead of a sword, but in addition to one. Because they could be used in extremely close quarters where swords, you need room to swing them. So here's a perfect example that is actually from one of Tolkien's stories of an elven dagger, a, a gondolin dagger no less, being used to great effect. So I'm going to read you a passage from the book The Fall of Gondolin. Then Glorfindel leapt forward upon him, and his golden armor gleamed strangely in the moon, and he hewed at that demon that had leapt again upon a great boulder, and Glorfindel after. Now there was a deadly combat upon that high rock above the folk. And these, pressed behind and hindered ahead, were grown so close that well nigh could all see. Yet was over ere Glorfindel's men could leap to his side. The ardor of Glorfindel drave that Balrog from point to point, and his mail fended him from its whip and claw. Now he had beaten a heavy swinge upon its iron helm, now hewn off the creature's whip arm at the elbow. Then sprang the Balrog in his torment and his pain and fear full at Glorfindel, who stabbed like a dart of a snake. But he found only a shoulder and was grappled and they swayed to fall upon the crag top. Then Glorfindel's left hand sought a dirk, and thus he thrust up, that it pierced the Balrog's belly nigh his own face, for that demon was double his stature, and it shrieked and fell backwards from the rock, and falling clutched Glorfindel's yellow locks beneath his cap, and those twain fell into the abyss. So Glorfindel finds himself in this awful position. He's fighting a Balrog, and he's getting grappled. He's in close quarters. And when you're getting, you can't really swing a sword. Now, swords usually do have heavy pommels. They're used for balancing, but you can also strike somebody with the pommel of a sword, usually on their head. But it doesn't work too well when your opponent is twice your height. So what he did is he sought a dagger because he could bring it up and stab it. He stabbed it in the stomach. A very long sword is very useful in some situations in combat, but once your opponent 
is within your reach, you, you need something smaller. So you could try the striking, but that wouldn't have worked too well in his situation. So he sought what, what Tolkien called a dirk. A dirk is a type of dagger. Somebody did try to argue with me in the comments about the dirk. Uh, and because I said that a dirk is a dagger and uh, I had to correct him because he said that a dirk is not a dagger they're made differently uh, the shape of the blade is different the way it's sharpened is different a dirk is not a dagger and I I was like well maybe I'm wrong I could be wrong so I looked it up and I looked up Oxford Dictionary dirk comes up as a short dagger of a kind formerly carried by Scottish Highlanders. So it very much is a dagger. It's a specific type of dagger, which was my point. There are many types of daggers, but that's that's why Sting existed for situations like that. Now, there are a lot of like uh, really fanciful fan ideas that Sting could have been Glorfindel's dagger. Probably not, right? Almost certainly not, because that was, in, that was near Gondolin. That was in Beleriand. And the dagger, along with Glorfindel and, and the Balrog, fell down into the cliff, and Beleriand's gone, it's under the waves. So it, it, was, it was a different Gondolin dagger. Okay, next question. This person asks, Why was Smaug more vulnerable to an arrow than a sword? He, well, he was up in the sky, you know? <laughs> I mean... Have you ever played Skyrim? And you have a sword and the, the dragon's flying, you have to you have to find some way to get him down. Sometimes you have to just wait, or you could shoot arrows at him, you can try your dragon shouts, you, you know, but you he's up in the sky, but um, realistically Smaug could have been killed with anything sharp as long as it hit him in that exact right spot. I spoke about it last week, left breast where the foreleg was thrown wide, so it probably came in from the side. Um, that was the only part of his underbelly and his chest that was not armored from all the gold and silver and gems that he had slept on for so long. And, and realistically, as well, would you really get that close to a dragon in his full wrath to try and use a sword on him? I mean, in a video game, it's one thing, but if you're, if you're Bard the Bowman, and that's another point, Bard is a bowman. He's Bard the Bowman, he's not Bard the Swordsman. So that was the weapon that he had. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why he would shoot an arrow at at Smaug. For one, Smaug is in the sky. Another, um, that is his profession. That is the way that, that he fights. Uh, if he was a swordsman, he probably would have had a sword, and that's probably what he would have had to try to use. It would have been a lot more difficult. Now, there are instances in Tolkien's work of killing dragons with a sword. Uh, and I'm going to use the Children of Hurin as an example. Uh, Turin killed Glaurung, who was sort of like the first dragon ever, um, by stabbing his belly from below. He he waited on, on a cliff, well, well, like on the bluffs, and uh, Glaurung was going to leap over the cliff, and as he came over, Turin struck upwards. Glaurung could not fly. He did not have wings. The winged dragons did not exist yet. So he basically... He was able to get that close to him and stab him because he laid a trap. The Glaurung had no idea that Turin was there. So there wasn't a fight. There was just Glaurung leaping over the cliff and then coming down with Turin stabbing him. Kind of a surprise attack. So the only way to kill a dragon with a sword is to get very, very, very close. And with Smaug being in his full wrath and flying, it had to be an arrow. Uh, there, there was no other way. It had to be some sort of ranged weapon. Okay. All right, this next question, uh, this was asked by uh, Martin Bauer. Martin asks, What would the Nine have done with the ring if they'd managed to take it from Frodo? And could the Witch King have potentially used it to try and challenge Sauron? Um, if the Witch King or any other of the Nazgul had gotten the ring, they would have brought the One Ring, and probably Frodo as well, to Mordor and deliver them to Sauron. That's the only thing that could possibly have happened. The Nazgul aren't really capable of acting outside the purview of Sauron's wishes. They are eternally bound to him through the power of the Nine Rings, the Rings of Power. And, you know, they, the, you know, they use those rings as mortal men. They became wraiths, and now they're bound forever to the One Ring and to Sauron. 
Um, that's why he's called the Lord of the Rings. That's why it's called that. So if he tells them, bring the ring and the Hobbit back, that's what they're going to do. They, they don't have enough will of their own. They have some will, but they can't act against Sauron. Okay, next question is from uh, Marie Haynes. And Marie asks, um, a bit of a long question here. There is a scene where Galadriel takes Gandalf's hand, and it feels like it implies that he had aged so much before her eyes. Is there anything in the movies that points to the fact that Gandalf is actually more than an old human wizard? So yeah, um... Uh, I mean, that's obviously that's the Hobbit films, right? Um, and I, I normally speak from the books, but it, it, it doesn't matter in this case, because Gandalf is not human in that sense. He, he does age, but he, age very, he ages very slowly. But Galadriel is very old, and she's, she's been around in Middle-earth since before Gandalf, so she would have seen all that aging, and she hasn't changed at all. Uh, Gandalf is an angelic being known as an Ainu, which means a holy one. Specifically, he is one of the Ainur in service to the Valar, which are like the, the greater angels. They're called the powers. So he's a Maya, which is a, uh, called the beautiful ones. So he was sent to Middle-earth as an incarnate, though. An incarnate meaning that um, he is bound to a body. You know. So, you know, uh, the, the, all the wizards were this. They're called the Astari, the wise. Gandalf's status as an incarnate means that though he is an Ainu, he is not host to the vast angelic powers that the Ainu possess. And he is, the Ainur is the plural version. He's bound to this flesh body. Now, normally, when an angel, an Ainu, comes, you know, to Middle Earth, or even in Amon, walks among the people and they take bodies, it's a raiment, like clothes for their spirits. It gives them shape and hue. Um, but Gandalf is actually bound to this body. He he ages. He grows tired. He has to eat. He has to drink water. He can even die. He was never young in the sense, but uh, he ages very slowly. So Gandalf's aging, they didn't really talk about this too much in the books, but they did mention it in regards to Saruman. Saruman, when he first arrived in Middle-earth, was said to have... His hair was black. But by the end of the Third Age, with the War of the Ring, he had almost completely white hair with just a little bit of black around the mouth area. So he was aging as well. So the movies don't really go a lot into Gandalf as being an angel and all that, but he does die, and, he, and then he returns. That was in The Lord of the Rings. And in his own words, he says he was sent back because his, his job was not done. He also sails west to Valinor at the end of The Return of the King, uh, showing that he's not human because humans are not allowed to do that. It was only by special authority that, you know, Frodo and uh, Bilbo were allowed to, and eventually Sam and Gimli would also sail west. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's basically that, like, even though he's technically speaking much older than her because he's one of the first beings ever created... As far as Middle-earth is concerned, she's been there much longer than Gandalf has, and she's seen him go from, I'll well, say maybe a roughly a middle-aged man to an older man, and she has remained the same. She's she's tens of thousands of years old, but she doesn't age. Once, she, once an elf reaches adulthood, it takes a very long time. The only elf that we know that entered a sort of an old age was Círdan. All right, so this next question was asked by Alice Stone, and Alice asked, what personal virtues and values did Tolkien strive to live by? It seems to me that Tolkien's favored virtue above all others was equality. Um, Tolkien was a hardliner for equality, and we see this especially with his stance during the Second World War. He vocally opposed the German governance. Uh, the, the exact word that he used was the pernicious and unscientific race doctrine of the Nazi party. He bristled greatly at any accusations of racism or even racialist undertones in his work, 
and he had a few regrets with regards to the orcs, the orcs, the goblins, whatever you want to call them, because he came to become uncomfortable that he had created a race, a fantasy race, but still a race that was always evil, and he struggled. I spoke about this brie uh, briefly in the past. He struggled greatly with coming up with an origin for them that reconciled this with his personal beliefs. He never truly succeeded. Um, the only one of his theories that got published in a story was that they were corrupted elves. Now, at the same time that he was opposing the Nazis, he also, and this is how, how important equality was to Tolkien, he was also opposing the anti-German sentiment that was very prevalent in the United Kingdom during the Second World War. I mean, Tolkien is a, a German name. He has some German ancestry. He was born in South Africa, and he spent most of his life in England, but he, he still had German ancestry. And, you know, being someone of having a German name and being opposed to the Nazis, people thought, you know, it must be okay to just badmouth Germans around him. And that's not the case. He was against what the German government was doing. But that didn't mean that he viewed all Germans with that same cloth. There was the German government, and then there was the German people. And he felt that, you know, because he had some German in him, and he didn't believe in this, that was proof that you couldn't just paint all Germans with the same cloth. So he was also outspoken, of course, about racism in South Africa, which, of course, hits home to him as he was born in that country. So... Um, he also, oh, I have to mention this as well, he was also in favor of equality of the sexes. He was an admirer of the feminist author Simone de Beauvoir, and he actually usually had some of her literature on him. There's actually a, a famous interview, uh, there's not many video interviews with Tolkien, so all of them are pretty, um, pretty special, and there was one where he was speaking about uh, feminism, and he took out his wallet, and he brought out her literature and read from it. So he had that ready to go. Um, so yeah, I, I think that was the most important virtue to Tolkien was equality. Good question, though. Okay, next up, this was requested by Jay. No last name, just Jay. That's perfectly fine, of course. And this is uh, this is the one from the thumbnail. I don't clickbait. It's, it's clickbait, but I deliver, right? That's what a friend told me. It's not clickbait if you deliver. Why is it out of the realm of possibility that the Arkenstone is a Silmaril? One was thrown into a crack in the earth. Okay, there's actually a lot of reasons why the Arkenstone can't be a Silmaril. This is a very popular theory that fans get, like, oh my god, what if the Arkenstone was one of the lost Silmarils? No, there's a lot of reasons why that can't be. So let's talk about these. First up, there's the origin of the Arkenstone itself. It was found in Erebor by the dwarves, and uh, then it was cut because they found it and they cut it into a gem. This is an important distinction. They found the gem and they cut it into that multifaceted globe-like jewel that we know. If they had found a Silmaril, it would have been an already cut gem because Feanor created them and cut them long ago. And the dwarves wouldn't have had the, the know-how to work with the unknown element, the Silmarilli, that the Silmarils were made from. They wouldn't have had that skill. Only Feanor had that skill. It was said that even Aula, the smith of the Valar, could not do that. So, um, Second thing is the location. So Erebor, and this is where they found that it's really far away from where uh, Maethros' similar made its final rest. And while it was indeed that Maethros threw himself and the Silmaril into a crack in the earth, they didn't mention a mountain. They just mentioned a crack in the earth. So... This happened right after the War of Wrath in Beleriand, or, or near Beleriand. It was just a few paragraphs after the description of Beleriand coming to ruin, sinking into the sea. There was no indication that after stealing the Silmaril from Eanwa, that Mithros traveled far to the east and crossed the Misty Mountains and found the Lonely Mountain and then threw himself into a fiery crack. That's not, the, you know, it, it, where he would have done that would have been way, way further west than where Erebor was. Next next up, there's Thorin's own description of the Arkenstone. I'm going to read you a passage from The Hobbit. The Arkenstone, the Arkenstone, murmured Thorin in the dark, half dreaming with his chin upon his knees. It was like a globe with a thousand facets, 
It shone like silver in the firelight, like water in the sun, like snow under the stars, like rain upon the moon. So Thorin is describing the gem shining, reflecting light in its thousand facets from other light sources and how it shines differently depending on what light source is, is nearby. He mentions firelight, the sun, the moon, the stars. The Silmaril would glow of its own accord. It has the light of the two trees of Valinor. It's bright without needing anything. It's not reflecting, it's not refracting, it's, it's just emanating light. So that makes the nature of the Arkenstone completely different. It doesn't actually glow, it just appears to glow because it's catching all the light around it. Last one, last one. Last reason why the Arkenstone cannot be a Silmaril. There is the fact that the Silmarillion in universe is a, a, a book that Bilbo put out, translations of Elvish lore from Bilbo Baggins. Now, you may say that um, other than the Eldar, the only person in Middle Earth that really knew about the Silmar, like, you know, really knew all this lore was Bilbo. He wrote the Silmarillion, right? So, or, or translated it at least and published it. So he never made a connection between the Arkenstone that was buried with Thorin and any of the lost Silmarils. So the closest thing to a connection to a Silmaril that we see in the Third Age is not the Arkenstone, but the star glass that Galadriel gave to Frodo. That had the same light, Yarendil's star, which is a Silmaril in the sky. And that so that too has the light of the trees of Valinor. And Sam makes that connection in uh, Book 6. Okay, moving on. So this question, it's sort of a very specific question, but I, I wanted to share with you the process that I went through in answering it. Uh, so this is requested by someone who I assume has to be named Matthew. It was, it was submitted um, anonymously, but the question is how to say Matthew in Quenya. Um, and this person notes that they had tried several translators and they don't know what is doing correctly. Those translators, if it doesn't recognize the word that you're putting it on with a proper name it almost never would it's going to assume that you spelled something wrong and it's going to give you the translation of a word similar to what you typed in so to come up with a true because matthew is not really a word it's a it's a word but it's a proper noun it's a name it's a given name so to give the quenya translation for a given name we have to look into the etymology of that name so um Let's talk about Quenya. So the root, or, or how we get to Quenya. So we're starting with Matthew. The root word of Matthew is Matityahu, which is Hebrew. And it means, uh, depending on the grammar, the gift of God or, or God's gift. So if you break this down, we can say, uh, if, we, if we know the word for gift is Anna, right? Anna is Quenya for gift. Uh, Anna is also one of the Feanorian letters. It's the, the 23rd letter, but that's just the name of the letter. But Anna as a word means gift. So then we so like, how do we come up with the God part? So there's sort of, there's two names for God in Quenya. There's Eru and there's Iluvatar. Why are there two names? Because they're just two different phrases that both pertain to God. Eru means he that is alone. Iluvatar is father of all. Now, ilu sort of means all. Iluva is all, everything, the universe, the world. Iluva is the universe. Um, I know Ea is the universe, right? But Iluva, there's, there's more than one name for it. If you're referring to the universe as having a name, it's Ea. But if you're referring to the universe and all within it, you would say Iluva and then the Atar of Atar is, is, is father, right? Uh, just like Anatar, which is what Sauron called himself in the Second Age, is, is the Lord of Gifts. Um, Vatar suggests father a little more than Atar is sort of like, Tar is Lord. So I think that putting it together, you can sort of, 
you could choose Iluvatar or you could choose Eru, right? Um, and I saw other people that were asking this question and they came up with Eruana. But I think it, Eruana does not sound particularly... It doesn't sound elvish, right? I think what you want is an elvish sounding name. So what I would do is I, because Iluvatar means the father of everything, I would take the father part and with a little bit of the everything, and I would mix it in with, of course, the word we have for gift with is Ana. So I would come up with Anavatar, and that actually sounds like an elfin, an elvish name, right? Anavatar. So that's how I would personally do it. Um, there's no like correct way because Matthew's not a name. It's an, in in um, in uh, Tolkien's world, right? And names are made in that way, whether it's Quenya or Cinder. And usually elves, they come up with a Quenya name and then they cinderize it. Um, it's usually mishmashed two different pieces of two different words. And they, of course, they have a father name, a mother name, an after name and all that. But uh, that's what I would say, Matthew. I would I would personally say Anavatar is Matthew, or the or has the same meaning as Matthew. Okay, next question: What would have happened if Frodo never volunteered to take the ring to Mordor? Well, someone had to volunteer because no one was going to be forced to or, or compelled to go. So if we look at the story as it happened, there were there were sort of three volunteers to take the ring. First, we have Boromir. That's right out because he he wanted to take the ring, but he didn't want to take it to Mordor. He wanted to take it to to Gondor to use as a weapon against Sauron. It is a gift to the enemies of Sauron, right? Or a gift to the enemies of Mordor. Uh, so yeah, that wasn't going to happen. Secondly, we have Bilbo. Bilbo kind of like loudly and exasperated was like, "Okay, you guys, I guess I'll go. I, I started this whole mess, right? And I'll end it." Oh, the Hobbit has to go, even though I'm so old. And they t and everybody at the, the council basically, uh, Gandalf especially, like Bilbo, sit down, relax. Nobody is expecting you to go. You you are too old. You've already had the ring. You've passed it on to another. It's not going to be passed back to you. It's already done enough damage to you. So then we have Frodo. Now Frodo didn't exactly arrive at Rivendell wanting to go any further than that. He loved the Shire still. He he wasn't exactly like Bilbo. He was he was akin to Bilbo, and not just meaning akin, but akin. He was like him, but he still loved the Shire, and he didn't want wish to be an exile from the Shire forever. I think he realized that as things were right then, he couldn't exactly just go back to the Shire. But I think he wanted to stay in Rivendell for a time, like like Bilbo had been doing. But then suddenly there was something within him. He was compelled to volunteer. He, he, he surprised even himself by volunteering. And this is one of those examples that we see in Tolkien's work. It doesn't happen a lot, but it's divine intervention. We, we see it a few times where something happens where a person is just compelled to do something. They're driven to do something. Now, if Frodo had somehow not received this sort of push or, or had managed to resist the call to volunteer. Who would be next? I think you would have two more volunteers. Uh, I think Aragorn would very reluctantly volunteer if he saw that nobody else was. But there was the issue that his destiny lied elsewhere in Gondor. He had to become the king. That was very important. It wasn't just the downfall of the Lord of the Rings. It was also the return of the king. So even if he was able to say, I'll put my wishes aside, I'll put my plans aside, I will go and I will take the ring to Mordor, everybody involved, especially Gandalf and Elrond, would have said, no, you have to go to Gondor. This, that's also very important. So I think it would actually come down to Gimli. Gimli is a dwarf, and that's really important, right? Dwarves have very strong resistance against Sauron's his magic, his, especially his um, seduction they were not really swayed by their rings of power, the seven rings. So he would make a really good ring bearer, right? However, I think that the quest would fail. It had to be Frodo. And I'll explain why. Because even though he was that strong, and he could make it to Mordor, and he could resist the temptation to use the ring, eventually he's going to get there and he's not going to be able to give it up because that's what happens to everybody. Nobody 
could willingly destroy the One Ring. It was destroyed through a happenstance. Well, first of all, there was a little divine intervention involved. As I mentioned, there is that. But there was the happenstance of Gollum being there. And Gollum was there because Frodo had shown him mercy earlier. He wouldn't kill Gollum, even though Gollum certainly deserved to die. He wouldn't even tie him up and leave him. He took pity on him. And it's it shows Frodo's character development because in the beginning of the book, um, Frodo's like, how could you pity this guy? And Gandalf said, I've seen him. And that's really important because once he sees him, he's able to pity him. And part of it is also that Frodo's a hobbit. Gollum is essentially a hobbit. He, or at least he used to be a hobbit. He's become something much more base and foul, but he still was born a hobbit, right? Gimli's not going to be able to identify with Gollum in that same way. I don't think he would outright slay him, but I think that he would tie him up and leave him. He, he would not allow himself to be waylaid like that, especially if he was traveling alone, although I do think that he probably would have had Legolas with him. But nobody was going to be able to actually give it up in the end. And without Gollum there, it just wasn't going to happen. Like, it had to be Frodo. So I think that's what would have... The quest would have failed if Frodo had not volunteered is the basic short answer. But I think that the ring bearer probably would have been Gimli. Okay. Fun question, though. Okay, so this next question is from Pasha Besh. I hope I'm saying that right. If Melkor had not fallen, would he have been appointed as High King of Arda... Or was the role always Manwes from the start? I don't believe that Melkor would have been the king of Arda any more than I believe that there's any scenario that could arise where he doesn't fall. Um, before the fall, even, before even Ainu Landala, before the music, Melkor was said to be the mightiest among the Ainur. But he, that's not everything. His brother Manwe was dearest to Iluvatar. Now, Melkor was privy to the majority of the thoughts of Iluvatar, but Manwe understood Iluvatar's purpose better than anyone else. So that's why he was favored. That's why he was destined to be the king of the breath of Arda. Melkor was greater in might, not in importance. It was ever the thought of Iluvatar that Manwe was going to be the king. Of, of, the, of the whole planet, and, that, and that's why he appointed him that role. What was Melkor's role going to be is a, is a, is a sort of a common debate. Personally, I think that, um, although Melkor certainly had his, his free will, and he was going to choose to fall, and that was something that he chose, I don't want to say that he was destined to fall, right? Because Tolkien wouldn't like that whole destiny thing, but if you think about the way that Iluvatar is and where he dwells in the timeless halls outside of time, the concept of time is not there. So when he looks upon the world, he might be seeing the beginning, the middle, and the end simultaneously. He might already know that Melkor is going to make that choice. It doesn't mean it's not a choice. It doesn't mean that Iluvatar created Melkor specifically to be the bad guy. But I think he knew that that was going to happen because he saw it. Uh, but that's sort of another discussion. All right, moving on to the next question. This is a this is a fun one. The Oski Voski asked me, uh, uh, does any movie maker have the rights to the Silmarillion? We are aware that Amazon and Peter Jackson have not. So no, unfortunately not. Uh, the, the only rights that have ever been sold to Tolkien's work uh, are movie rights and television rights, specifically regarding the Third Age. Um... The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Even the Rings of Power, as you said, Amazon doesn't have rights to the Silmarillion. They have rights to The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And when you see in the credits, it says based on The Lord of the Rings and its appendices, because they're telling a story that is sort of told through the appendices, just without all the extra added detail uh, that the Silmarillion gives you. So they're they have to tell it as a broad stroke story. So nobody has the rights to the Silmarillion. And I went over to the Tolkien Estates website. And in their frequently asked questions section, it said that they have no plans to produce or allow to be produced any motion picture or television show based on 
the Silmarillion, or any of its related stories. They do mention, they are aware that this is something that a great many people want, that, that, that it would make many Tolkien fans happy, they just don't have plans for it at this time. So I think, and this is not really a wild leap, that the main fear of ad adapting the Silmarillion and its works lies historically in the book itself. The Silmarillion is not an extremely lengthy book. Do I have it handy here? Oh, that's the... See, that wouldn't do. It's it's sort of like way out of the way too, but that's the soft, that's the paperback. I don't think I can reach it to... Uh, let, me, let me see if I can reach it without having to move the chair and everything. Oh, that's really... No, I'm not going to be able to reach that without getting up and that would just make the video longer, but it's not a long book. It's less than 400 pages, right? And um, if you think about that, that's shorter than The Fellowship of the Rings. That's shorter than The Two Towers. And it's it's even shorter than The Return of the King proper, if we're not counting the appendices. It's, it's shorter than that. Um, the issue is that in that short length, at nearly but not quite 400 pages, there's an insane amount of ground that's covered. And a lot of it is kind of almost glossed over it's told very quickly the Silmarillion is not really a novel per se but it's a collection of lore and stories it's what Bilbo Cole translations from Elvish lore trying to adapt the entire thing into a single film would see characters appear for just one scene and then vanish forever because they're mortal and they have to go through many 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 years there would be scores of characters that would just come and go, and it would be almost impossible for a viewer to keep track of everyone. The Silmarillion is a lot of information that's rapid-fired at the reader at a very high speed, which is why many say that it's a difficult read. Now, let's say we do it as a series, right? Let's break it down into several stories. If I was the one with all the money in the world to make a proposal to the Tolkien estate for a Silmarillion film series, this is this is what I do, and I actually laid this out here, let's see. It would be seven films, right? Seven films, and I even have titles. So the first one, The Music of the Ainur, A Middle Earth Legend. We get the creation, the migration from Middle Earth to Eman, you know, the awakening of the elves, they all go to Eman, the War of the Valar, the creation of the orcs, the Noldor, their kingdom in the Undying Lands, and then the two trees. And I would end it with Melkor, Feanor, and Fingolfin leaving Aemon going to Middle-earth. The Silmarillion, a Middle-earth saga. This would be the wars in Beleriand, and I think you know, you'd have to focus it on Feanor and his sons and the Oath. I would prefer to end this, we'll say, after the aftermath of the third kinslaying with Iarandil sailing to Aman and uh, treating with Manwe to intervene. Then, the third one, we would have the Children of Hurin, a Middle Age tra- uh, Middle Age. Uh, the Children of Hurin, a Middle Earth tragedy. Obviously, we take this from the novelized form, right? We would end this, of course, with the burial of Turin and Nienor. Hurin and Morin finding the gravesite. It's it's a hell of a story. It would make a great film. Beren and Luthien, a Middle-earth romance. Now, of course, we have a novel to, to base this off of, right? Beren and, Lu Beren and Luthien would make a really good movie, a really amazing movie, I think. Now, some of these are taking place simultaneously to others, but I don't think that matters all that much. They're all their own stories that could be told separately. The Fall of Gondolin, a Middle-earth adventure. We'll start with Tuor, his journey to the coast. He meets Ulmo, he goes to Gondolin, and then we have Aeol and Maeglin and Indus and Morgoth and the big battle and Gondolin Falls, right? That would be great. The War of Wrath, a Middle-earth epic. So all of the previous story, this is like the, the Avengers Endgame, right? I wouldn't say that to the, to the Tolkien estate. They would get pissed off, right? But... This is like that. Everything comes together. It coalesces into the final confrontation with Morgoth, the sundering of Beleriand, the final disposition of the Silmarils, and, you know, it would leave us with, well, Sauron still out there, though. Uh, and then the final one would be the fall of Numenor, a Middle-earth cataclysm. So 
the, the forging of the Rings of Power, Sauron's capture, Numenor, Akalabeth, and ending, of course, with the last alliance of elves and men. So maybe the rights never got sold because no one came to the Tolkien estate with the correct pitch, right? Maybe they're waiting for someone to have a meeting with them that goes really well. So it could happen. But I think it, the only way it's going to happen is something like that. We're not going to get one movie based on the Silmarillion. It's never going to happen. Okay, next question. Did any elves remain behind in Middle-earth after the departure of Frodo and Bilbo from the Shire at the end of the Return of the King? Yeah, yeah, there were elves left. The, that wasn't the last of them. I mean, it was um, Elrond was leaving, Galadriel was leaving, and uh, uh, um, Gildor and Glorian was leaving. But there were there were still many elves in Middle-earth. I mean, Círdan was there, but he makes the ships. He doesn't sail on them. He just sends them along their way. He wouldn't leave until he senses that there are either no elves left in Middle-earth or no elves left in Middle-earth that want to sail west. That the only elves left would want to stay in Middle-earth. And then he did finally sail west on what is known as the final ship, and it said that he had Celeborn with him as well, and who knows how many other elves. Legolas was still out there. Um, he was out there traveling with Gimli. He wound up sailing west at a later date with Gimli. Um... And there was Elrond's sons, although they, they may have become mortal at this point, but they you know they were there. Haldir, he died in the movie, but he was still alive in the books. Uh, Glorfindel, and there were there were many other unnamed elves as well that were both from Imladris or, or Lorien, or even Lindon. So there there were elves out there. Okay, next question: What is the difference between a Valar and Ainur and a Maia? Um, okay, so I could break this down real easy. Ainu or Ainur is the, is, the, is the plural, that's Holy One. And it basically is an angel, right? They were the first beings that Iluvatar, who is God, created. Uh, he created, along with all of the Ainur, they had a big, big concert, you might call it, a, a song of creation called Ainur Lindala, Music of the Ainur. And they, he used the flame imperishable, or the, or the secret fire, if you prefer that, to make their thoughts a reality. And that's how the world and the universe were created. Now, several of the Ainur, a lot of them, decided that they were going to go to this world. And the 15 fairest and greatest among them were called the powers. For it was by them that the world was powered. They were bound to it. So, uh, if we take the powers and we translate that to Quenya, we get Valar. Then the remaining ones, all of, all of the Ainur that went down into the world but were not the 15 powers, we had the beautiful, is what the elves call them, and the Quenya word for that is Maya. So basically, Valar and Maya are types of Ainur. And the Valar are the greater, more powerful ones. You know that serve the one, whereas the Maya are the lesser angels that serve the Valar. Okay. All right. Next question is from C. Minior. Hope I'm saying that right. What did Gandalf do between the Hobbit uh, book or movie and the Lord of the Rings book or movie? Not after Bilbo's birthday party, but before. How many times did he visit Bilbo since Frodo knew him as well? Um, I don't know how many times he visited, but it was a lot. And a lot of this information is actually covered in The Lord of the Rings. Um, once Sauron declared himself openly, and this is about 10 years after he was driven out of Dol Guldur, so t 10 years after The Hobbit, Gandalf suddenly became very, very busy. First up, they had the final meeting of the White Council where Saruman implied that he had knowledge that the One Ring had passed from the world, that it was lost forever in the Balagir Sea. He was lying. We know that, but uh, he didn't like that Gandalf suddenly brought up the One Ring. He thought he was up to something. Why would Gandalf suddenly bring up the One Ring? So Gandalf was traveling to the Shire many times, and Saruman started spying on him because he wanted the One Ring for himself, and he was already kind of looking for it. He, As a matter of fact, he had already found Isildur's remains and, and destroyed them, uh, keeping only, I think, his pendant. So he was suspicious that Gandalf suddenly brought up the One Ring. He had spies watching him, and that's how Saruman came to know of the Shire and how uh, Gandalf was going there a lot. Then, of course, 
Gandalf was tracking Gollum, and this is something that happened over a period of years. Uh, Gandalf sought Gollum's whereabouts for a long time because he was curious about the nature of Bilbo's ring. He was afraid it might be a ring of power or might even be the One Ring, and he lost track of Gollum right around Mordor. So then that was kind of a wash. Uh, he also became friends with Aragorn. Uh, they became close. And uh, Aragorn, he was young. He he went south to Gondor and to Rohan and fought some wars with them as a soldier, uh, calling himself Thorongil. And uh, this was actually the beginning of the distrust between Denethor, the steward of Gondor, and, and Gandalf, because he believed that Gandalf was up to something and that this Thorongil was some man that Gandalf, or as he called him, Mithrandir, was trying to put on the throne. And he was right. <laughs> um, so, you, And also, another thing that he didn't like, and this is another thing that Gandalf did in Gondor, was that he became close to Faramir and he tutored him. So, you can see that there, there were six decades between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, but a lot was happening with Gandalf. He was bouncing all over Middle-earth. He was going from, from Rivendell to Mordor, back to Rivendell to Gondor, and then, of course, with many trips to the Shire in between all of that. And a lot of those things that I mentioned, you know, that took took many years. So that's, that's what Gandalf was up to. Okay, next question. What became of Moria after the War of the Ring? Was it eventually reclaimed by the dwarves once more, or completely forgotten and left to rot? So it was reclaimed by Durin the Seventh, also known as Durin the Last. Though you have to dig a little bit deeper than usual to find this information. So in the Lord of the Rings, if you look at the appendices, there's, uh, you know, the all the family trees, and Durin the Seventh was listed as a descendant of Thorin the Third Stonehelm in the genealogies, and instead of a direct line, there was a dotted line between the two, indicating that there may be um, unknown or unnamed descendants between the two. However, if you check out the book The Peoples of Middle-earth, we get some clarity about uh, Durin's parentage and, and his deeds. So Christopher Tolkien in, in The Peoples of Middle-earth noted that the family tree that was in The Lord of the Rings was not the final version of it. And that's why that had that dotted line. And he said that he had found a later version of it that indicated that Durin the Seventh was actually Thorin the Third's son, and that there was a writing there that said that Durin the Seventh reestablished the kingdom of Moria. So uh, that's what happened. It's it's a little bit obscure because you have to go to um, the history of Middle Earth and sp the specific volume, The Peoples of Middle Earth, to read about that. Okay. All right, next question. Why did Eomir become king of Rohan? Well, it is likely that no matter what, when Theoden died, Eomir was going to become king. Um, but it did show in the book that Theoden did specifically endorse Eomir as the king of the Mark. Theoden did have a son, Theodred, but he died. He was next in line to be king, but he died when Saruman attacked the Westfold. Uh, that left Theoden childless, but he had been raising his nephew Eomir and his niece Eowyn. So Eomir, you know, being closest in king to the king, he he's the uh, the elder of the two, and Rohan didn't have ruling queens. Um, he was the next in line to be king of the Mark anyway. Uh, but as the dying king's closest kin, um, Eomir was actually there when, when Theoden died. And uh, he considered... Aemir and Eowyn to be his son and daughter. He called them son and daughter. So let me read you the passage from The Lord of the Rings that indicates this. For a moment, the thought flitted through Merry's mind. Where is Gandalf? Is he not here? Could he not have saved the king and Eowyn? But thereupon Aemir rode up in haste, and with him came the knights of the household that still lived and now had mastered their horses. They looked in wonder at the carcass of the fell beast that lay there, and their steeds would not go near. But Eomir leapt from the saddle, and grief and dismay fell upon him as he came to the king's side and stood there in silence. Then one of the kings, oh, I'm sorry, then one of the knights took the king's banner from the hand of Guthlaf the banner bearer, who lay dead, and he lifted it up. 
Slowly, Theoden opened his eyes. Seeing the banner, he made a sign that it should be given to Eomir. Hail, King of the Mark, he said. Ride now to victory. Bid Eowyn farewell. And so he died, and knew not that Eowyn lay near him, and those who stood by wept, crying, Theoden King! Theoden King! So you could see with his his dying breath, his last words were to specifically endorse Eomir as the king. Not that he really needed to do this, but I think he felt that he should. Okay, uh, next question. Did Gandalf try to talk sense into the Balrog before attacking it in Moria? Yeah, in a way he did. In a way he did. Um, Gandalf makes a speech when he faced off against Durin's Bane, and it kind of sounds like he's casting a spell. It happens very quickly, especially in the film version. But it is, in fact, Gandalf communicating several things to the Balrog. Gandalf wants the Balrog to know who he is, that he is aware of what the Balrog is, and that he is not afraid, that he is the greater. So he says, you cannot pass. Gandalf is setting a boundary. He's telling the Balrog he, that the Balrog is incapable of getting past him. He says, I am a servant of the secret fire. Gandalf is identifying, identifying himself as an Ainu, who serves the flame imperishable. The one who stands alone, Eru Iluvatar. Gandalf says this in a fashion that the Balrog will understand, but the Fellowship of the Ring will not. They'll think he's just chanting a spell or something. He says he's the wielder of the Flame of Anor. It's a boast of power. Anor is the Sindarin name for the sun. The Balrog is a being of flame. Gandalf is basically saying, my fire is hotter than yours. My fire is greater than yours. My fire is brighter than yours. You don't stand a chance. He also says, the dark fire will not avail you, flame of Udun. This is a refutation of the Balrog's power, of course, but also a note that Gandalf is not just some fool who doesn't know what he's up against. Udun is a Sindarin word that basically means hell, and... It's also the cinderized form of the Quenya word Utunno, which was the name of Melkor's fortress in Middle-earth, his first fortress. So he's basically saying, I know what you are and what you're capable of. Go back to the shadow. So Gandalf tried his best to tell the Balrog to give up, to try and talk it down. But of course that didn't happen. And I think Gandalf knew it wasn't going to happen on some level, but... Um, we know that the Balrog did hear him and did understand him because uh, he took the Flame of Anor thing to heart. Because it is said that after Gandalf's speech, the Balrog dimmed its flames and expanded the shadow because he, it saw Gandalf and realized what he was up against and realized that the flame was not going to work on him. Now, a lot of people, whenever I speak about the Flame of Anor referring to the sun, I think it's pretty cut and dry, a lot of people were under the assumption that he was referring to the ring that he held, the ring of power, the one of the three uh, elven rings called Narya, the ring of fire, and that he was basically saying, hey, look, I got the ring of fire. Um, the Balrog has been under Moria since the First Age. He has no idea about the rings of power. He does not know what that is. It means nothing to him. Anor is the name of the sun. So, uh, yeah, that, that's definitely... Gandalf wouldn't also reveal that he has a ring of power, either. He only showed it at the very end of the story after it had lost its power and the One Ring was destroyed. Uh, Frodo did notice that it was on his finger. It was on his finger the whole time, but it was invisible. He chose to reveal it at the end, much like in Lorien, Galadriel chose to reveal her ring, the Ring of Water, to Frodo. Only Frodo could see it, though. Sam couldn't see it. He saw Iarendil, the star. He did not see the ring. Frodo was no longer a ring bearer. The, the one ring's gone, and he, the fact that he was able to, sh to see Narya at the end of the story when they're at the Grey Havens shows that it's lost that power and that Gandalf is no longer, no longer hiding it. So Gandalf wouldn't boast about a ring of fire because it's not that sort of thing. It's not a weapon. It's 
you know the three the three rings are like fire, water, and air, but they they don't do those sort of things. Like you might think like, oh, Elrond has the water one because he made the the water come. No, he has the ring of air, because they're not weapons. All right, one last question for today, guys. And uh, let's see, why did oh okay this one comes up from time to time. Why did three eagles fly to rescue Sam and Frodo from Mount Doom instead of two? So, a lot of people, it's a big meme, right? They all like to say, this big heart-wrenching meme. Oh, the third eagle was for Gollum, right? And we all stop, we pour one out for, for the little wretch. The fact, it's not the case. So, Gandalf was carried by Gwehir, who's the Lord of Eagles, and he asked him to bear him, and that two other eagles come. And it should be understood that one of those eagles was to carry Frodo, and the other eagle would be to carry Sam, and of course, he, you know, the third eagle is Gandalf. Um, the movie sort of muddied the waters a little bit, because they kept the three eagles, but instead of Frodo getting on an eagle and Sam getting on an eagle, Gandalf sort of reaches down and scoops Frodo up onto Gwe here with him, Sam gets on the second eagle, and the third one's just sort of hanging out with, with nobody to carry. And that's what gave a lot of thoughts to that the, the intention was that Gollum would take that one. It, it, it certainly might have been Peter Jackson's intention to give you that thought, but it wasn't Tolkien's intention. Gandalf suspected that Gollum might have some part to play before the end. And he did know from Faramir that, that at one point that Frodo and Sam were traveling with Gollum. Um, but he had no reason to believe that Gollum had survived at that point. Indeed, I could say that um, there's no way that Gandalf would foresee Gollum living after the destruction of the One Ring because he was so bound to it. If, it, it, if Frodo had somehow miraculously managed to just throw the ring in, I think Gollum would have just leapt right in after it. He wasn't able to live without the ring. He, he was too he was too bound to it. So, like I said, the movie sort of muddied the waters here, right? But the reality was it was one for Frodo, one for Sam. You might say that in the movie, Gandalf kind of called an audible because Frodo was so out of it, he might not have been able to properly hold on, and that's why Gandalf scooped him up like that. Now, in the situation that Gollum was there, I have no doubt that Gandalf would have saved him as well. Um, he would have helped him, absolutely. He probably would have had Gollum and Frodo double up on an eagle. But he didn't foresee that Gollum would be there. So that's why. Anyway, guys, that was the last question for this week. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. I will see you guys next week. And also we have some other content coming out. We have an iceberg video and some other stuff that I'm working on. So uh, keep an eye out.